War may be hell, but presidential war is bliss. This is presidential war. Presidential war. Welcome to the Dead Presidents Podcast. I am James J. Hamilton. And I'm Stephen Lincoln Douglas. And we're back with another exciting installment of Presidential War. That's it. America's favorite educational, presidential, historical card game. Coming back at you again. And we're going to be adopting the five-card draw variety of the game as kind of the standard. It just... it. You know, makes you think a little bit more, gives you a little bit more play. Yep. Not not quite so random. It, it's just, uh, it's the superior version of the game, you know. Yep, we like it. Millions of our raving listeners like it. Yeah, they attest to it, so that's what we're going to stick with. So, the cards are dealt. We've got our five card hands in hand. We've got the complete book of U.S. presidents at hand, and we're ready to begin the game with our first category. Most underrated. Most underrated, and here we go. We're going to bring out the old C-SPAN mm. historian's ranking of the presidents. Yeah. I think it's yeah. I think it's a 2017. Oh, 2017. C-SPAN. So here we are, and this one it takes a second because you gotta ranking. you gotta locate your people on here. Hmm. I've made my decision by process of elimination because none of my people seem necessarily overrated yeah. or underrated, rather. Yeah, I'm, I have to say the same thing about my people. I'm gonna go with Grover Cleveland. You got first or second term there? Second I mean, term. that is second term Cleveland. Second term Cleveland. And, uh, well, I guess that doesn't factor in with this particular category. And he's going up against uh, Chester Arthur. We got Cleveland at 23. We got of... Arthur at 35. Hmm. Now, yeah. Cleveland all told... Which is the way I think we'll be looking at this. Yeah. Certainly underrated on this list. They have him below Grant, JQA, John Adams, McKinley, Clinton. Madison. Yeah. Um, Obama, Wilson, he's, he's Lyndon Johnson, John F. Kennedy. Yeah. yeah. I mean, those are... You know, that's... He seems incredibly underrated. Arthur is... Uh, Potentially underrated at 35, but that's probably about the range he'd be at. Yeah, I just kind of had to play that one. This is this is going to go to Cleveland. He's totally underrated on this list. Yeah. Yeah, Arthur, he could probably... He might be a little bit higher once we get to our Arthur episode. His historical reputation will probably rise. Yeah, I think so. As most presidents get the... Dead Presidents podcast bounce. Yeah. In their ratings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Grover Cleveland uh, is probably. Yeah, he seems unjustly. To be several spots higher. Yeah, unjustly low here. There are a handful of the people that are, I consider, pretty Cleveland's overrated actually, on this Cleveland's list one of my are, are above him. I really like Grover Cleveland, especially first term Cleveland. But yeah, I mean he's pretty yeah, I'm, solid. I'm, I'm a Grover Cleveland fan. I think it's kind of yeah. I don't know how you put like John Quincy Adams ahead of him that he's rated at 23. And J yeah, John Quincy Adams is I mean, ahead of Grover Cleveland. Come on. I mean, come on, C-SPAN. If you're considering just his presidency, come on, historians JQA not very distinguished and shouldn't be in the top half. Yeah, I don't know how they're looking at this. 
if they're doing whole life. I mean, I think it's you know? it's supposed to be their presidencies. Should be. I don't know. I find fault with this. Well, but I mean, it's it's clearly a Cleveland victory. Yep, Cleveland going to take the first category. We're going to move on to our next category. Biggest election victories. Well, I'm going James Monroe, and I'm going to repeat of last episode, but tables have turned. Ronald Reagan. Yeah, Reagan last time pulling off a Vic over Franklin Pierce, who did pretty well for himself in 1852. But Reagan, I mean, he throttled incumbent President Jimmy Carter, and then he absolutely devastated Walter Mondale. Yeah. Crushing majority. 49 states. Yeah. Just huge... Monroe. And as for Monroe, you got a guy that second time around was unopposed. Yeah. So there's a serious argument to be made there. Reagan had opposition. He just destroyed them. Yeah. Uh, Monroe pretty much didn't have any opposition. Yeah, 1816, he ran against really the last vestige of the Federalist candidate for president, which was Rufus King. Yeah. Monroe. Poor Rufus King. Winning uh, the Electoral College 183 to 34. Yeah. By 1820. And that's a Reagan-sized victory. Yeah. By 1820, Federalist, nobody even bothers to put up a candidate against yeah. him. Uh, one Monroe hater in the Electoral College cast his vote for JQA. Yeah. But he was unopposed and won the Electoral College 231 to 1. Yeah. Of um, course, the apocryphal story was the guy didn't want to sully George Washington's record. But the fact was, he legitimately disliked James Monroe. Yeah. So, yeah, pretty huge election victories. Yeah. Of course, that was coinciding with uh you know a party realignment really the collapse of the opposition party and we're before the popular vote yeah this is yeah around the time that that's just gonna kick in yeah um i don't know i'm kind of leaning towards reagan just because i kind of factor in you know yeah the landscape the people was spoke. much different yeah the, you, you have a very strong two-party system um, it's not quite fair, but yeah. he, still. I mean, he you know? takes over. He, he goes up against an incumbent Democratic president who came in after the Republican Party had been kind of, uh, you know, really in the dumps after the Nixon resignation. Yeah. Uh, you'd think that the Democrats should be ascendant. They're controlling Congress. And yet, you know, Reagan comes in there and just wipes the floor with them twice. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you still have a strong Democratic Party after that, mm. but he just whipped them. Yeah. Whereas Monroe riding out, like, already 16 years of Jeffersonian That's it, and with, like, really, dying, moribund opposition. Yeah. You know? He really had all the cards in his hand. Yeah. Whereas Reagan, him, his own personal... You know, self was a big part of that. Yeah, I think we got to go Reagan, right? Yeah, I'd give Ra Reagan a back-to-back -back victory in this category. That's and his next category. Up. Next up, we're going most devious. Hmm. I guess I'm going to have to go James Madison here. I'm going Woodrow Wilson. Yeah. Because... I mean, let's just, let's have it out. Woodrow Wilson was a piece of shit as a historian. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, I think he was a little bit devious. Maybe not as outright as others, but I think it was there. Well, that's the thing about deviousness. It's not necessarily... In your face. Open. Yeah. 
But yeah, I don't know. He had he had something dark in his brain, you know. Yeah. Yeah, he did a lot of stuff. I mean, during World War One, you know, kind of bringing back the the Sedition Act. Yeah. Which um, was kind of shocking during the John Adams administration before the First Amendment was ever, like, really established and enforced. And Well, and he suffers an ailment that pretty much prohibits him from performing his duties as he needs to and mm. covers it up. Yeah. Yeah, and also, yeah, I don't know how, how public... I don't think he was, uh, you know talking about how racist he was in public speeches, whereas that was certainly privately. Oh, yeah. Like, one of his favorite things to do was, like, part of to his character. mimic, like, minstrel shows and stuff and mm -hmm. put on accents. Like yeah. a big old doo-doo head. Yeah. Madison, I mean... I went with him. I, I think he's more clever than devious. Yeah. I don't think he had, like, ill intent where, like, Wilson maybe yeah madison not particularly devious i'd almost say that jefferson was more was was more more devious in some of his his dealings um yeah madison a pretty clever operator he may be kind of not so much as president but during the washington administration while well, him and jefferson are putting together the opposition party yeah. while trying to, you know... Yeah, look, I mean, there had to like be, like, a certain that. level of political deviousness in, like, the early days, but mm. I don't know. I feel Wilson kind of takes the cake on this one. Yeah, definitely go with Wilson in this category. That will bring us to... The category of post-presidential accomplishments. Mm. I'm going to go Herbert Hoover. That's a nice draw. By default, and you'll understand when the next card is drawn, <laughs> by default I'm going with Barack Obama. Well, who, he's still pretty early in his post-presidency. He is, but look at him. He's surfing and shit, wakeboarding, looking yeah. bad, buying, being popular, buying a place on Mars, returning Vineyard. to the White House and making Joe Biden look a fool. Yeah, Joe Biden doesn't look too great standing next to him. No. So, yeah. Obama, he's still pretty early in his post presidency. Yeah, he he's, is. I mean, you know. I mean, he's pretty. He's very young for a post president. Yeah, he. I mean, he's doing his thing. He's still personally very popular. His yeah. party wishes that he could, he could be president again, probably. Yeah. And um, yeah, a lot of a lot of you know what put Joe Biden in office is his connection to Obama and a yeah. lot of former Obama people around him. Which is why it was necessary for Barack to come back to the White House recently. Here, you know, mm -hmm. Biden kind of. Not looking great in the polls. Need a uh, shot in the arm that, you know, Obama can provide. You know, Joe Biden needs Obamacare. Yeah. Well. Hoover, I mean, a great, you know, sage. In his older years, he yeah he had a president sought him out and lived till 1964. Had yep. 30 years where the post presidency mm -hmm. another another one of those like JQA who's pre and post presidencies more successful than his yeah. actual presidency. Yep, uh, Truman named him coordinator of the war of the food supply for world famine uh, organization. Yeah, and uh, like which he had excelled at during World World War One. You um, know, I mean. Hoover's pre-presidential accomplishments are epic. Yeah. And then uh, 1953 to 55, the Hoover Commission making recommendations to streamline the government, uh, many of which were adopted. Yeah. 
Um, and b- that's Truman, by the way. So you know, you got to say who a Hoover, a Republican. Yeah. You know, Truman, a Democrat. So he's being called upon. Yeah. By both sides, really, very uh, effective with his administrative yeah. acumen. Also, as as here in the, I think we've mentioned this before, but in the complete book of presidents, it notes that uh, he, in uh, his during his 1938 tour of Europe, he met with Adolf Hitler, whom he found to be quote partly insane, yeah, but intelligent and well informed, yeah. So, yeah, determining have, Hitler to be part, <laughs> partly insane, a partly accurate take on Hitler, right. Yeah, I mean, Obama just hasn't had as much time, so I think we yeah. got to go Hoover here. Yeah, I'll bet if you cast out 30 years into Obama's post-presidency, he could probably win this hand, but... Still yeah, it's a early. distinct possibility. We'll so it. now we'll we're down it. to our last uh, choice, we're a forced draw. And we're going... Oh. Who would we most like to meet? And I'm left with William Henry Harrison. And I'm going to meet George H.W. Bush. Well. Yeah, of course, William Henry Harrison, not an option for you in post-presidential accomplishments. Correct. Yeah, he was, I was forced to use him here, but I think that works out okay. Mm. William Henry Harrison would be an interesting person. Yeah. You know, with his, uh, you know, you're looking at Ohio and Indiana. Yeah, I mean, he's a guy, he was around during, you know, Washington, you Adams, to him Jefferson. About, uh, Tecumseh. Yeah. And Tenskwatawa, the prophet. He saw a lot of, a lot of stuff. Yeah. He's yeah, he'd a, be an interesting person. And I think it's the allure, you know, he died after a month in office. Yeah. You know, you kind of want to try and get a sense of the guy. Yeah. Yeah just the mystery of it where george h.w bush like he came up in this last episode you know uh it would probably be pretty cool Mm -hmm. you know he's a pretty nice guy you wouldn't get much out of him i don't think Mm. but i mean he's yeah he's seen a lot as well he could have his world war ii stories yeah all the way up through skydiving as a 90 year old man right yeah ambassador of the united nations envoy to china director of the cia Mm Hmm. pretty epic dude father of president governor son of a senator yeah there'd be some things to talk about the time plays in um Yeah, George you Bush, know, more uh, of a familiar person to us moderners. Yeah. I think me personally, well, I don't know. There's a hint of resentment at Harrison and people like him for the Native American treatment. But that's not to say that George H.W. Bush has clean, lily-white hands. <laughs> You know, yeah. Okay. I never said milky white. Yeah. <laughs> but well, um, I'd probably like to meet old Tippecanoe. I yeah, I'm kind of leaning towards him just because of the time. You yeah. know, the timing thing comes into it. You know, it, it'd be interesting to hear what he had to say about a lot of things. Yeah, whether or not I agreed with him. Uh, it would still be interesting. Yeah, you kind of feel like you know George Bush. I feel like you also, know him. Also, if you meet him, he might vomit into your lap. Oh, yeah, if the Bushuzuru might Bushuzuru you. Happens, you know. <laughs> it's well, time to draw another so five cards. We'll have Harrison take that hand, and we will draw a new hand, which we will use to choose in the category... Of looks. Who's the sexiest president in your hands, dude? <laughs> oh, man. 
I know who mine is. Yeah, I'm... All right. Well... I'm going Jerry Ford. Jerry Ford, not a bad one. I went FDR. Hmm? You know, suave, rich. I think the money helps. Yeah. A lot. I he's mean, he's a... not he's not JFK. He's FDR. Yeah. So the money helps. You I know. mean, yeah, he's a pretty handsome guy. Yeah, FDR talks and the money walks. Right. Well... But then Gerald Ford, our most athletic president, former... Who was a fucking ma- model in magazines, basically. You know, come on now. You can't even... Jerry he's Ford, a, that physique. You know, little... You know, he's more balding as president, but as a younger man, he's pretty strikingly handsome. Yeah. And then you got those... I mean, I'm sure mutt- FDR was... Pr- Pretty fit yeah. up to a point, and then after that, you have yeah. like little Stretch Armstrong kind of legs. And... Right, Ford has those nice muscular NFL caliber legs. Yeah, great calves. Yeah, where is FDR? Good quads. Yeah, if you're if you're a leg strong glutes. If you're a leg man, you're not going to be very satisfied by FDR. Yeah, I mean it, it's a shame to say, but yeah. He was cut down in the in his physical prime. Yeah, them's the breaks. Managed to hold on. Yeah, this is Jerry uh, Ford, man. Mentally, Jerry Ford. Jerry Ford is going to run away with this one. Indeed. Touchdown, Ford. We'll move on to the category of pre-presidential accomplishments. I'm going to go William Howard Taft. I'm going John Tyler. Hmm. John Tyler, um, uh, you know, standard kind of Virginia rise in politics. But, I mean, he really, really makes his fucking mark on history as vice president. Well, I mean, mean, it's kind of, well, it's more the transition into being president, but, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Other than that, pretty basic. It's it's more like, you know, that stagey period where it's like, oh, uh, shit, the president's dead. Uh, is this guy the president? And he's like, you bet your ass. Fuck yeah, I'm the president. Yeah. You know, just that. Mm. And then it was just like, oh, yeah, it's a fish. Mm. It's a fish. <laughs> well well then you got William Howard Taft who had a pretty born distinguished in, born into the Taft dynasty mm-hmm. graduated Yale uh, became a prosecutor a collector of internal revenue for Ohio Ohio's first district, lawyer, assistant solicitor of Hamilton County, Ohio, judge of the Cincinnati Superior Court, United States Solicitor General, then judge on the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. Then he was governor the, of the Philippines and yep. You know, I yeah. I mean, I think this goes to Taft. Uh, Secretary but, of War turned down the Supreme Court a couple of times as yeah. a pre-presidential career. Yeah, I think you got to go Taft here. John Tyler is just too standard, I guess. A rise of like yeah. a wealthy Virginian that. You know, yeah, studied I mean, law and went to good schools, and yeah, and in a way, got you know, into politics, became a governor, complained that there wasn't enough power in it. Mm-hmm. His pre presidential career is not one that put him in a position to be elected president, right? He kind of got into it by being a vice president at a time when nobody wanted to be vice president, or yeah. at least prominent members of the party did not, right? 
whereas Taft, his pre-presidential career put him in a position to be the hand-picked successor of one of the greatest presidents. Yeah. Where he was just kind of like obviously that guy. Right. Um, pretty distinguished. Indeed. So Taft going to take the category. Indeed. Which brings us to the next category, Best Educated. Could have used that Taft card in this as well. Yeah. Instead of Yale, I'm going Harvard with the F or alluded to Theodore Roosevelt. And I'm going James Buchanan. Well, Buchanan learned the fundamentals at common schools and studied Latin and Greek at Old Stone Academy in Mercersburg, Pennsylvania in preparation for admission as a junior to Dickinson College in Carlisle in 1807. He studies hard and takes a special interest in logic and metaphysics, but also finds time to get into a little bit of trouble. Uh, yeah, he has a hard time, but he does eventually receive his degree in 189. Then he moves to Lancaster to study law under James Hopkins, applying himself diligently, reading law during the day, taking walks at night to contemplate what he had learned. And he early develops a facility for putting arcane legal concepts into everyday language. He's admitted to the bar in 1812. Not a whole hell of a lot to speak of, I suppose. But not terrible. Well, pretty solid education for the time. Teddy Roosevelt, as a boy, you know, pretty sickly, did not go off yeah. to probably what would have been the standard boarding school uh, at the time because of that. Studied a little bit closer to home uh, as a kid. Actually uh, went to Germany for a summer where he studied German and French. Came back... Uh, went into Harvard University, of course, where he uh, excelled in sciences, German rhetoric, and philosophy, joined the prestigious Porcellian Club, of course, fought in the Harvard Boxing Championships yep. as the bloody runner-up, graduated uh, magna cum laude, 21st in his class out of 177 students. Went on to attend Columbia Law School for a year, but dropped out to run for the state legislature. Uh, his education, you know, putting him in a position. He wanted a career as a naturalist and um, really became a very prolific uh, author. Things kind of coming out of his education. Yeah, I think we give this to TR. Yeah. They are a little better educated than J.B. Yep. Which will move us on to the category of Who Would You Rather Have Date Your Daughter? I'm going old Honest Abe. I'm going James K. Polk. Wow. Um, Polk, uh, well, if your daughter's into politics... That'll work. Yeah. Other than that, I mean, eh. Well, I mean, he had a really good relationship with his, with Sarah Polk. Yeah, they were kind of meant for each other. I mean, an average person probably not going to have a great time with James K. Polk. Well, one thing, you know, as a father of of a daughter prospectively dating James K. Polk, you're not going to have grandkids. Right. That's one thing. Yeah. Polk not fathering any children following yeah. his horrific gallstone operation as a yeah. young man. Yeah. Whereas, but I mean he's a man of he's a focused He's a yeah. good good provider. Hard worker. Yeah. Pretty solid, not you know, 
not engaging in any uh, adulterous behavior, very faithful and loving as a husband. Yeah. Yeah, he really need yeah, he really needed that wife who was uh into the same political game as him. Yeah, That's and he really needed one that was so likable because he wasn't. Yeah. Whereas Lincoln pretty likable guy. Yeah. Affable, he would joke, he would tell stories and it'd be hard not to like him, you know. And he's not unsuccessful. Mm. You know? Yeah, he comes up from nothing but makes himself into something. Mm -hmm. Self-educated, put together his own law career, and of course a rising man in the political establishment. Mm -hmm. Just a pretty genuinely decent human being. Our number one funniest president. Yeah. He'd win you over with... His various yarns. Yeah. I think you got to go Lincoln here. Yeah. And him, you know, in real life, uh, ended up with a wife who was not as likable as him. Yeah. But he stuck by her. And uh, was very uh, supportive of her needs. She had a lot of needs. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. think our daughter will be very happy as Mrs. Lincoln. Yeah. And Lincoln probably would have been happy with happier with a <laughs> hypothetical generic <laughs> woman than yeah. with Mary Todd. <laughs> There's a chance. Yeah. Well, and that's well, going to bring us to best politician. And the last card in our hand, I have to go with Ben Harrison. And I got George W. Bush. Well, well I'm going to just say right off, Ben Harrison, but um, talking about both, George W. Bush did all right at the beginning. You know, he was always known for the kind of shit grammar and, you know, well, he was a folksy yeah. man of the people. Yeah, he, I mean, he. it obviously he had success. I yeah. mean, you know. I mean, he certainly cashed in on, you know, who his father was to get his start in politics. Yeah. But, yeah, he ran for, you know, became governor of Texas kind of out of nowhere yeah. um, when he was viewed as maybe not really being a Texan. Yeah. And then he became the ultimate Texan. Right. Yeah, I mean, he did all right. But, I mean, Ben Harrison was like a pretty serious party head in those turbulent days. Yeah. Post-Civil War politics. Yep, served, uh, served in the war, of course, and then... Had a lot of uh, legal experience. Um, I mean, he knew the political game. He did it pretty well. He was pretty important in 1880, you know, to name one big thing. Mm -hmm. I'd have to, you know, George W. Bush may have been the decider, but in the game of presidential war, we are the deciders, and... I think Benjamin Harrison takes this hand. All right. We'll give it to Harrison. Draw another five cards. Draw another category. Who had the most accomplished vice president? Hmm. I've got a few of my five cards are, you know, some of them are guys who did not even have vice presidents. I guess I'm going to have to go with JFK. I'm going to go with William McKinley. Well. And not Garrett Hobart. Well, Garrett Hobart, pretty good vice president. Yeah. McKinley loved him. But. He, he died. He died. Now, of course, this category and, uh, being... 
the accomplishments of the vice president at the time he's vice president. Yeah. Which you got TR there. Right. You got TR and LBJ. LBJ had LBJ been master may of have, the Senate. Yeah, he may have successfully assassinated the <laughs> president as <laughs> vice president. Well, that's just speculative. We'll we'll figure that out in the forthcoming JFK and LBJ episodes. Yeah. We'll be able to render a definitive verdict. Get to the bottom of we'll it. We'll figure out who was ultimately responsible for that. Right. But yeah, too bad. I mean... Too bad we didn't have LBJ for that best politician category, because yeah. that's just really where he excelled. Definitely. He really became a dominant figure in Congress, and that's what kind of got him on the ticket, even though Kennedy probably didn't really like him much personally. He was a very powerful uh, guy. Yeah. And, uh, well, TR, I mean... He's more rough there riders. for his reputation. I mean, well, he did a lot of stuff. He's in the New York State Assembly. Yeah. New York Police Commissioner. But as a vice president. Well. You know, he's kind of there because of his reputation. I mean, because he's going to get votes. He's well, from New York. That's crucial. You know. I mean, in a lot of ways, he's he was, popular. He's a war hero. He was put into the vice presidency to get him out of the governorship in New yeah. York because other members of the party wanted it. Yeah. I mean, this is more category being like his lifetime of accomplishments yeah. up to being vice president. Well, I think if that's the case, you have to go TR. Yeah. I definitely go TR in this category. Yeah. He was uh, assistant secretary to the Navy course served in the spanish american war the famous rough riders yeah. putting that together Just governor of new york was a cowboy for a time yeah i mean he was just an all-around bad man he certainly was he's gonna take this category next up yeah, best president overall. Oh, God. I don't really have a lot to choose from here, which you can tell by out of the four cards I'm going with, John Quincy Adams. I'm going Harry Truman. We started off this game talking about how John Quincy Adams wasn't that great of a president. And yeah. Was overrated on the C SPAN. And rankings. out of your four cards, that's the choice. Oh, he's, you made. <laughs> he's clearly the best out of uh, better than the three I've got. Oh, here. man. <laughs> Hopefully, I get some categories that are not substantive to their accomplishments as president. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, JQA, he had a lot of great ideas, but he didn't get to do anything yeah pretty much truman man he's one of the ones man with his first stint mm. finishing up for fdr i mean he backed into there as the kind of guy who nobody would have expected to be president whereas jake yeah. was kind of to the manner born and got in there at the wrong time truman maybe in there at the right time yeah the right man for that job yeah and i mean his second his second term is term in his own right you know perhaps not as accomplished but still not too awful bad yeah i see the kind of same thing with eisenhower mm -hmm. they both had really good first terms Second terms were a little bit more wishy-washy. Grover Cleveland's another one. I mean, yeah. that happens a lot. And as we, you know, as we just talked about John Quincy Adams as uh, number one in the top five secretaries of state, yeah, promulgating the Monroe Doctrine at a turning point in the U.S. Uh, relationship with the world, Truman kind of presiding over another turning point in foreign relations. Yeah really setting up setting the u.s up to ultimate victory in the cold war mm -hmm. i mean it took a while but he's the one who started us off there yeah yeah i'm a i'm a harry truman fan i like truman yeah i mean I, he easily takes this one in my opinion he does we're 
we're gonna go Truman. We're gonna move on to the category of best businessman. Mm. And I'm gonna play Andy Johnson. Well now because it doesn't which, matter. Which card do I wanna throw away? Yeah. And Ed, Andy Johnson not highly ranking as a president, but as a tailor. I think I'll pretty solid. I think I'll throw away Bill Clinton. Yeah. Bill Clinton would be probably thrown away here. He was uh I mean the Clinton Foundation is a successful business, right? <laughs> well maybe. In they, a, in a I certain mean they light. make a lot of money. Well that's pretty successful. They did. A cynical person might say that business existed uh, to promote Hillary Clinton's chances of being president, and it didn't succeed. What? <laughs> well, you know, pre-presidentially, Bill Clinton was a lawyer, but I don't think he really spent a lot of time in the private sector. No, nah, he was. A, I mean, he was a good politician. Yeah, he I became mean. a. He was attorney general of Arkansas, I believe, and then governor, president. He spent. He's, he's like a, a. He's a more sleazy Obama. One of the. He was yeah. a likable dude. Mm -hmm. You know, people thought he was kind of funny. Not, you know, yeah. popular guy, but he was a bit of a sleazeball. Yeah. Whereas Obama, you know, kind of had all the Clinton a little more had, character. Plus he was like a decent person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bill Clinton, not much to speak of businessman wise. Whereas Andy Johnson. Born into nothingness. Yeah. Apprenticed off as a tailor. Ended up with a very successful tailoring business. Yeah. Consolidating his power as a tailor. Yeah. And parlaying that into uh, investments in real estate and farming. Mm -hmm. Ended up making enough money to serve as a politician and live off of his passive income. Yeah. Yeah, he clearly takes this hand yeah pretty good businessman indeed moving on we have most accomplished children <laughs> <laughs> I'm going Millard Fillmore I'm going Richard Nixon Trisha Patricia Nixon graduated Finch College Married Edward Cox in a White House Rose Garden ceremony in 71. She and her husband settled in New York, and she really doesn't talk publicly on matters of substance, according to the complete book of U.S. presidents. And then Julie, of course, married Dwight David Eisenhower II, grandson of President Eisenhower, in 1968. She was a graduate of Smith College, she wrote, Special People, a collective profile of six famous persons she met during the Nixon administration. Of course, Special People, published in 1977, only recently acquired its present title. Its original title, <laughs> Miss you, Norm. And she also wrote Pat Nixon, The Untold Story, in 1986 biography of her mother. She and her husband lived in Southern California for a time, and in 1980, they settled in Chester County, Pennsylvania. Uh, she was a loyal and outspoken defender of her father's actions during the Watergate affair, and she reportedly urged him not to resign. Hmm. Watergate, nothing to see here. Yep. A loyal daughter. Some pretty solid accomplishments. Fillmore, his son Millard Powers Fillmore, studied law at Harvard, became a lawyer, served as private secretary to his father as president, practiced law in Buffalo, became a federal court clerk. Fillmore's daughter, Mary Abigail Fillmore, um, tragically died at the age of 22, but was pretty accomplished uh for a young lady at the time yeah graduating uh 
from school speaking French, Spanish, German, and Italian, was a school teacher, um, performed a lot of the duties of First Lady when her mother was ill, and she was an accomplished musician playing the piano, harp, and guitar, performing at White House functions. And I even got to play her piano. Yep. I think, I don't know, you gotta go Fillmore. Yeah. Yeah, I want to go film more for the tragically shortened, accomplished life of young Abigail Fillmore. Yeah. She would have been something. Neither of Fillmore's yeah, and Miller children. Miller Powers as well. Yeah, I mean, pretty not solid. too bad. Neither of, neither of them, had, of course, had any children of their own. No direct descendants yeah. of Miller Fillmore surviving. It leaves us with our last card in this particular draw. Best Statesman. Well, I'm going to go with the card that I definitely could not have played for most accomplished children, being Franklin Pierce. Yeah. <laughs> whose children all died young. Yeah. And I've got Martin Van Buren. Van Buren, obviously, a master politician. As a statesman, though... Uh, perhaps, well, somewhat lacking, as opposed to being a politician. Yeah. But his pol still... Politician skills obviously outshine his statesmanship, but yeah. he was a secretary of state. He was it. briefly served as ambassador to Britain. Yeah. Not too awful bad. Stepped in... Uh, I mean, he was just all around... He really, a, a pretty strong figure. Yeah. After the uh, Caroline affair where the British uh, set an American ship on fire and sent it over yeah. Niagara Falls because it had aided Canadian rebels. Right. Van Buren uh, stepping in to cool some tensions down, put that on a diplomatic yeah. path. Yeah, that's, and that's pretty good. Uh, Pierce, his statesmanship, I mean, if you were a Southerner, you were probably pretty soaked on the Pierce administration. Mm. I don't know. Statesman-wise... There's not too much to speak of. You have the Gadsden Purchase. Yeah. Which, you know, completes the current border in the Southwest and allows the completion of... You know, important railroads and whatnot. Yeah, I don't think there's there's a lot to be said for Pierce in terms of statesmanship. Where I mean, he you you tried to buy Cuba just, and it got botched. Yeah, you know that was a huge backfire. Um, when it got out, the manifesto that made it sound like they were would justify the seizure of Cuba yeah. by force. Leading Kansas was a shit show. Yeah, he just, you know, you'd think that Pierce, almost who he was as a man, would set him up to be, to have qualities of a statesman, yeah. but he it did not deliver as president. No. But the whole Kansas, Nebraska. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Stuff, and I still, you could kind of argue that he had a cloud hanging over him you know i mean yeah. suffering the loss of his last living son basically on the way to be inaugurated there's no way that he was functioning at his highest capacity you know yeah. but i don't know it, it doesn't help him in any event yeah i think we got to go mvb yeah when it came to kansas nebraska he's some consider was almost cowed into supporting that by Douglas and, yeah. and the Southerners or he was really in favor of it either way not a very statesmanlike move no and not a kind great look what was siding with the um you know bullshit government of Kansas other than the yeah the Kansans who who wanted a, a free state yeah with Lecompton and all that fun yeah. stuff so, Van Buren showing himself as the superior statesman. And draw another five-card hand. We move on to 
the next category, that of nicest guy. Well, I'm going to tell you right away, whatever card you have, you're throwing it away. So make your choice carefully. All right. Well. I may have hurt myself and influenced um, the game. Well, I think I'm going to go with the same card I was going to go with anyway, which is Calvin Coolidge. I got Jimmy Carter. Well. Jimmy Carter, probably the nicest man that was ever president. Just an all-around good dude. Yeah, look at that smile. Yeah. You can tell how nice he is. Yep. Silent cow, pretty. He's a swell guy. He's done awesome humanitarian work. He's mm. just he's just a good dude. Yeah. Calvin Coolidge, I'm he's... not going to knock him. I think Calvin Coolidge was awesome. Yeah. He's pretty... He was a good dude. Yeah, he's pretty solid dude as well. Jimmy Carter just... The JC, man. <laughs> this, did, did he put up with his brother Billy Carter without publicly just, like, lambasting him? Yeah. He didn't, like, call Billy Carter a piece of shit on national TV. Yeah. He, he has to be a nice guy. He was probably afraid that Billy would give him a swirly. Yeah. Or an engine burn. Mm-hmm. Or a noogie. Yeah. Jimmy Carter, pretty nice guy. Yeah. As a president, crushed by Calvin Coolidge. Yeah. But. I mean, he's a, he's just category. a good dude. Mm-hmm. You know? Ask Tim Allen. Yeah. I think you gotta go JC. Pretty he, solid he's, guy. He might be the best card for that category. It's, I think I, he likely is. It's definitely his best category. Yeah. We'll go with our next category. First Lady Accomplishment. I'm going Frank Cleveland. I'm going Abigail Adams. Ooh. The legendary Abigail Adams. So ahead of her time in so many ways. What an icon Abigail Adams is. Mm. To all women, I think, you know? Yeah. It, what more can you say? Yeah, just, uh, yeah, pretty much the intellectual equal of her very formidably intellectual husband. Yeah. And at a time when that was not commonplace at all. Mm -hmm. She was so ahead of her time. Like, I, I fucking love Abigail Adams. I'm not trying to take from... Frank Cleveland, who was very important in a lot of ways. The nation loved her. Mm. They loved the Clevelands. Yeah. But Abigail Adams, you know? yeah. Frank Cleveland, she had, what, the home for friendless colored girls? Nice name. But that was yeah. a good thing. You know, she did her part. Mm-hmm. And she was highly influential with fashions and products, and her image was used unlicensed. Yeah, a lot of times. Married in the White House to the sitting president. Yeah, it was a huge deal, and the nation ate it up. They loved it. If there was reality TV, then oh boy. Yeah, she was very successful first lady. Yeah. For her time. Coming, yeah, she's strong in this category. Coming in, Absolutely. in there at a very young age. She's a great card in this category, but Abigail Adams, man. Yep. She's going to take it. Which will bring us to our next category. Biggest partier. I'm going to have to go Andy Jackson. I'm going LBJ. Hmm. Andy Jackson, as a young man, received a small inheritance from a distant relative. And blew through it right quick. Proceeded to blow it all on... We're talking presumably. horse races, we're talking cockfights, we're talking gambling, we're talking dueling, drinking, smoking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Andy Jackson's a partier. He got it on. Up to a certain point. LBJ, I think he was probably always a little bit crude and always, like, open to 
at least, you know, I'm sure he drank at home, but he yeah. was definitely like a social drinker. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you could even tell in some of his recordings when he's had a couple. Yeah. You know, so he, he wasn't adverse to partying. Yeah, wasn't wasn't he drinking and driving in the didn't he have a story of that? Yeah. Yeah. No, there's a there's a bunch. There's just, a bunch wasn't he of drinking? Stories. Wasn't he drinking like on his way to church or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was drinking and speeding. Yeah, on his way to church. Well, just that's what God would have wanted. Yeah, yeah. This is actually a pretty tough one because I feel like Johnson was more like a a static partier. You yeah. know what I mean? He was probably doing it with more regularity than Andy Jackson, uh, who maybe at the beginning was really hardcore, and then when he kind of settled down, mm -hmm. not so much, but he was still, you know, he was probably still drinking with friends, yeah. you know, and stuff. Yeah. He'd have J James K. Polk over. over for some old crow, yeah. They'd, they'd talk politics undoubtedly. Undoubtedly. <laughs> over, over a some glass old of crow. old crow. It's an old magazine Ad would have for old believe. crow. Yeah, it's pretty wild that in what the fifties or sixties, the way that old crow chose to advertise was by with Andy J Jackson and James, and James K. Polk, K. Polk yeah. in, a, in a magazine ad. Well, I don't know. This is a tough one. It really is. I don't know if you consider like cockfighting and horse racing as part of partying. Yeah, it's pretty boisterous. I'd probably want to go with Andy Jackson here. Yeah, I I think we I think we could do that. Next yeah. up, Andy Jackson was probably knocking back some drinks at the epic uh, American Eclipse uh, horse race. Yeah, with his I'm sure his brother Cock of the Rock was on hand. Uh. Helping American Eclipse train, yeah. of course, one of the biggest victories in horse racing history at the time. Indeed. Andy Jackson was there, living it up. That's right. That's going to bring us to who would win in a fight. Well, I'm going with the man who is, I believe, the reigning PWF champion. No. Yeah. None other than George Washington. That's I'm going to go with Zachary Taylor. Might not be a bad contest. Yeah. Washington, pretty tall. Yeah. Pretty fit. Washington's got the reach. He's got the height. Taylor, I mean, I, I think it would be a hell of a battle. Yeah, Taylor's pretty tough. Yeah. Long time serving in the Army. He's got to be in pretty good shape. Yep. Pretty tough. Pretty used to physical deprivation. He could but probably as is Washington. Yeah, Washington, a longtime frontiersman, great horseback rider, just a very powerful individual. Yeah. And there was a story during the revolution where some soldiers were like, uh, you know, having an argument. A lot of uh, insubordinate, like, lack of discipline, boisterous, and Washington just charged into their fray and grabbed one of them by the throat. <laughs> and they all scattered. Yeah. Like, he's he's a pretty tough man. Yeah, you, you wouldn't want to play with him. I mean, he's the current holder of the PWF championship belt. Indeed he is. That's, and although uh, I think Taylor would be a good well, opponent. Yeah, you never know I what's going to happen. Taylor could be a contender at some future event. You never know. For so now. In this case. We're going to have to go George Washington. Yeah. Which well, last card of this hand now. And the category will be most accomplished parents. I and have got Dwight Eisenhower. And I'm left with Thomas Jefferson. Well, Thomas Jefferson's father was... Pretty accomplished in his time. I think yeah. he he died while de while his son was still relatively young. I know he was a major uh, 
surveyor of the Virginia frontier at the time, I believe he put together the definitive map of Virginia for his day. That's it. We're talking Colonel Peter Jefferson. Uh, Married into one of the most prominent Virginia the families. Yeah. Family. He married he, Jane Randolph. He and definitely married up. That's a pretty good accomplishment. It, indeed, and he owned about 7,000 acres and uh, held a lot of local offices, including magistrate, sheriff, justice of the peace, and chancery court judge. From 1745, he's a leader of the county militia, first as lieutenant colonel, later as general commander. He also represented his county in the House of Burgesses during 1754 to 1755. Pretty important time. Mm -hmm. As assistant county surveyor under Joshua Fry, he helped fix the boundary between Virginia and North Carolina in 1749. And shortly thereafter, Fry and Jefferson were commissioned to undertake a comprehensive survey of Virginia. Their map completed in 1751 was long regarded the definitive guide to the colony. He would die of an unknown cause at 49 when Thomas was just 14 years old. Yeah. As for his mother, Jane Randolph, obviously really rich family. She was born in London, came to America with her family as a child. Oh, Not a hell of a lot's known about her. Jefferson rarely mentions her in his writings. Mm -hmm. uh, she was said to have been uh, mild-tempered, and according to biographer Merrill Peterson, she represented a, quote, zero quantity in her son's life. She died from a stroke a few months before Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence. Wow. Well... I've got Dwight Eisenhower, his father, David Eisenhower, um, moved the family to Kansas, did not like farming, studied engineering, but dropped out of college to get married. He was a partner in a general store. His partner absconded with the business's cash, leaving David Eisenhower to face bankruptcy. He worked in a railroad, worked as a mechanic, was a manager of a gas company. He was considered a just man and well-liked. Eisenhower's mother, Ida Stover Eisenhower, was deeply religious and a pacifist who wept when her son went to West Point. President Eisenhower said that she was a good hard worker a teacher and a truly wonderful woman. So, seems like he had some, uh, you know, nice salt of the earth parents, but yeah. not particularly uh, successful. Not in the sense of Peter Jefferson. No. no. Peter Jefferson, kind of a big deal, setting his son up in the Virginia aristocracy. Yeah. Yeah, we gotta go, oh, we gotta go TJ here. Yep. TJ's going to take it. We're down to our last two cards. That's it. We're down to the last two cards. The uh, final four presidents in the final two categories. The penultimate being first lady looks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to choose mine sight unseen because I'm not... I'm going to have to go with James A. Garfield. Oh, interesting. Okay. I'm going with Lucy Webb Hayes. Nice. So yeah. let's resort to Google. Yep. Our old friend Google Images to help us objectify these women. Yep. That is the name of the game. Lucretia Garfield. Mm. A classic beauty, you know? In a sense. Yeah. And I think same could be said for Lucy Hayes. Yeah, Lucretia Garfield, not too bad looking, especially... Yeah. I'm kind of leaning towards her. She's got a... She's a little bit more of a pixie. Yeah, you see some of these pictures of her when the two of them are young. She's pretty good looking. 
and then even in her older age, holding it together. Lucy Hayes, I mean, yeah. Well, you got the picture of her and Hayes when they're young. She's pretty good looking as well. Yeah. Hmm. Got more of a librarian look to her in a lot of portraits. Mm -hmm. Lucretia Garfield, I don't know. Like I said, I think she's got a little bit more of that kind of pixie look. I don't know. <laughs> this one, this one picture of Lucy, uh, Lucy Hayes. I'm looking at. I thought, hey, she looked good in this picture, and then I saw another version of that same picture saying that she is 16 years old in that picture. So oh. that one, that picture does not qualify. Yeah, that is not legal to consider in this category. But this is a close one. I'm leaning towards Crete. Yeah, I go. I'll, yeah, I could give it to uh, Mrs. Garfield. But both of these ladies, pretty good looking. Mm hmm. And that brings us down to the wire. And you'll see why I laughed when I didn't choose this card for the last category. This category, the final category. Who would you pick first in flag football? And I'm left with Ulysses S. Grant. Well, yep, you didn't want to go with Julia Grant in the last category. I didn't want to go with Florence Harding, who lost this category last time. Julia Grant actually won in that category yeah. before. I think in the very first episode right? of Presidential War. When she went up against James Buchanan, who's... Uh, had no one to represent him in that category yeah. as he is not known to have ever slept with a woman which is what qualifies someone in that category but in this category we're talking flag football we're talking U.S. Grant we're talking Warren Harding two Ohioans ready to battle it out on the gridiron I mean Grant, definitely, if I was faced with the two. I mean, I'm, you know, Harding might be all right, but... Yeah. Fuck, I mean, Grant's there. Harding. Harding's five foot eleven. He's probably a little taller than Grant, but... Or wait, no, I'm sorry. I was reading from Herbert Hoover. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Harding, six foot, six feet yeah, tall. Yeah, I was going to say, he was pretty tall. He was Large pretty tall. boned and full chested. Six what? Six feet. No, six six feet, feet even. even. Mm. But his health was generally poor. Suffering a nervous breakdown at age 24. Yeah, he was a smoker and a drinker. And, yeah. An adulterer and a gambler yeah. and... He, well, he was a golfer. Yeah. He played poker. But as far as physically vigorous activity, not really uh, much to be spoken of. No. Nah. He doesn't necessarily seem like a graceful athlete. No. Nah. I think we got to go Whereas Grant. Grant, just with his tenacity. Indeed. He'd would pick, be he'd, formidable. He'd, he'd let him be captain of your flag football team. Yeah. yeah. He would probably do a pretty good job at it. Yeah. And that's going to bring us to the card count. <laughs> close game indeed 
as close as it can be without being a tie. That's it. A lot of our games turn out like that. They do. I ended up with 20 cards. And I had 24. Thereby, James J. Hamilton, the victor, this month on Presidential War. Yep. I feel it was that came down to that very close match between Lucretia Garfield and Lucy Hayes. Yeah, perhaps it did. And also that epic fight between George Washington and Zachary Taylor. Yeah. Two close matches that ended up winning this game for me. That's it. I'd like to thank Lucretia Garfield and George Washington, along with many other great presidents who helped me win this game. A good way to put it. And that's going to bring us to the end of Presidential War this month. For the Dead Presidents Podcast, I'm Stephen Lincoln Douglas. And I am James J. Hamilton. We'll catch you next time. Thanks for listening.